Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, Mariah Smith is going to kick us off. Thank you, Professor Racino, and thank you, everyone that came out. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of Falls members here and CAFs. And, um, today is National Ag Day, and it's a nice day for us to reflect on how we get to enjoy treats like this and the sustainable good food we have for us back there and people that work for it. And um, Today we're going to look at the laws that affect our policies and how we move forward on these essential things that we have. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank all the panelists on the behalf of Falls and for coming out. And please eat the food because we paid for it. So. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks a lot. And I'll leave it to Professor Rustino to introduce the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Mariah. Um, we're really pleased to be hosting this panel today for National Ag Day. It's not only a celebration of agriculture, but also of our VLS alums. Um, and as some of you may or may not know, the Vermont Law School has a long history of graduating uh, both farmers and food entrepreneurs that work in all kinds of, of food, both locally and hyper-locally, regionally, nationally, and international work. And we think of food and agriculture systems very broadly here at Vermont Law School, and we have a really great deep tradition. So it's, it's an honor to have um, these alums with us today who've taken time out of their busy schedules to uh, be with us today. Um, I'm gonna start off the conversation with them, but I will then open it up for people to come and uh, ask questions of the panel. They represent a depth of experience in the world, so I, I really hope that um, if you have questions or want to engage them in a dialogue, you, you'll step up and do that. We're very pleased today be, we're being filmed by uh, cable TV, uh, White River, and that will be aired in about a week, so we're happy to be on that. And we'll also be having a, a, this taped here as well and have this available for people who can't be here with us today. Um, so I also wanted to thank the partnership that the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems has. I'm the director of that center um, with FALLS, the Food and Ag Law Society. FALLS is one of the most robust um, student-focused uh, societies, I think, in law schools anywhere in the nation, and they continue to do really wonderful, innovative work for the community um, and beyond. So I want to thank them for this today. So on to our panelists in our discussion today. To my left is Amy Heifer. She's from the class of 2000 VLS JD. She is the co-owner of Stratford Organic Creamery, which is right down the road here. And we are enjoying her organic ice cream today, too, which is wonderful, and we thank her for that. Um, next to Amy is Sofia Krzyzewski, one of my first research assistants, um, and uh, was a fabulous student when she was here, but she graduated in 2013, and now she is a program specialist for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition in Washington, D.C., and we're very pleased to have her here with us today. She's working on some of the legal issues of the day for food producers and farmers nationally. And there's Beth Bupley, who is um, now a partner with BCM, in, which is an environmental and land use law firm in New Hampshire. But previously, she was a partner with Lambert Coffin in Portland, Maine. She's a real pioneer when it comes to food and farming law and entrepreneurism. We're very, very happy to have her here with us today. And next to Beth is Beth Wilhite, another Beth. And she is a graduate of the uh, VLS JD class of 2005 and also happens to be a classmate of Amy Manzelli's who's another partner in that law firm. Beth happens to be the co-owner of Royalton Farms right here in South Royalton. They are really innovative food producers um, growing Kobe beef and two breeds of heritage pigs and they do direct marketing to New York City as well as um, some other, I think, processing of their foods as well. So she's a, a great example of a local food entrepreneur with a very wide market or a specific uh, high-end market in New York City. So with that, I, I thought I'd kick it off today. We're really exploring the intersection of law and food, and in some ways that may not be as obvious as some people think of that. Um, 
law really is involved in a lot of things that we do. And I think especially in the food movement, uh, it has a significance because we're really innovating how we can change the law to help scale and rebuild actually local food systems. And so I think that's probably a perfect segue to one of my experts on that topic, which would be, which would be Beth. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because you've done it in three states. You're barred in three states. Right, uh, and I continue to practice in three states. In fact, I'm pleased to say that one of the reasons my joining BCM was to expand BCM's practice from New Hampshire into Maine and Vermont. Um, so I got into this particular area of law sort of as a natural outgrowth from my prior um, career as a restaurateur. And I was uh, an owner of a restaurant and um, cook in the restaurant back in the uh, mid 80s into the early 90s. So that, um, and at the time, that was before people were doing a lot of local sourcing. Um, my uh, partner, who was my husband at the time, and I felt very strongly about buying locally and using as much local um, product as possible. So uh, we would have been delighted to have a farm like Beth's uh, nearby. Um, we didn't, uh, we were down in the southwestern part of Vermont. Um, but we did have um, beefalo that we locally sourced. We had a lot of local um, farmers who were growing vegetables who, who um, wanted to sell directly to us. So we did a lot of that. So I had that experience of, uh, as, a, um, as a business owner. And when I started practicing law, it was a, a natural fit for me to represent different um, business owners and do business law in general. Uh, as the food movement has developed and evolved, uh, particularly in recent, in the, in the last, I want to say, five to seven years, um, it became very clear to me that there was a real need for lawyers who know enough about the business and uh, farming and food production uh, to be uh, valuable advisors, but also advocates um, for the industry. So that kind of led me to develop the farm and food practice group in my former law firm, Lambert Coffin. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great, it's a great intro, actually. And I think I'll take that and just ask um, the other uh, on the uh, panel, could you, Beth Willey, could you talk a little bit about how the lack of legal infrastructure or law in general has really shaped your business or been an impediment? Sure. Um, so we didn't, uh, we started a farm as a hobby in our backyard, my husband and I. We decided that we wanted to grow our own food. We're from Chicago originally, and we moved here so I could go to law school. And I was working as a litigator. Uh, I had my own firm, and that's how I was making money. And he is in construction. And so we started a farm not because we come from a farm family, but because we wanted to be farmers out here, you know, city folk wanting to be farmers. And as it developed, we realized that it was a fun thing to do, and also we could make money at it. Um, and it was a nicer lifestyle than being a litigator, which is <laughs> challenging. <laughs> um, now we're at a phase where we're growing and we have a distribution company in addition to our farms. We have a slaughterhouse that is USDA licensed and there is one lawyer, me, on the staff and a bunch of uh, individuals who are great and skilled at what they do, but there isn't another lawyer that I'm friends with that I can bounce ideas off of in my community. I do have lawyer friends from when I practiced, but no, none of them specialized in ag law. Uh, before I came here, I started to research in this state what lawyers are putting themselves out there as specializing or having some knowledge in agriculture law, and I couldn't find any. And it got me thinking about Vermont and the fact that we live in an agrarian in an agrarian state. Farming is a way of life here, and yet we have a lot of lawyers in our state, 
and very few of them have decided to focus on agriculture law. So we desperately need good people that really want to work with businesses, not just regulators, and help make farming profitable again in this state and in New England. You have a successful local organic creamery. How did you do that? Because you do your own distribution and marketing. I mean, there's a whole kind of business scale that needs to happen. Uh, yeah. yeah. Does, does this work? Um, uh, well, I be, came to law school because my waitressing career wasn't taking off. And <laughs> I thought that uh, if I had a law degree, I could go back to my small town, which is Jackson, New Hampshire, and hang out a shingle and eventually be able to afford the 10 acres of land that I thought I needed to be happy in the world. And uh, I was also, while I was here, wait, um, cooking and bartending at Crossroads Bar and Grill, and I met this guy. And that's how I got into farming. And I married him between my second and third years and graduated pregnant with our first kid. And I haven't had a lot to do with the law. Um, and I'm not, honestly, to tell you the truth, I don't know if there's an, uh, a great dearth of agricultural lawyers in the world because I do what I can to avoid them. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're a dairy farmer, you don't like to go to the, um, you don't like to go to the bank unless you're making a deposit. You don't like to go to the um, doctor unless you're on a stretcher, and you don't like to go to, to a lawyer unless you're um, picking up a new piece of land. So um, that doesn't. I told you this when you asked me about this. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I want to. I actually, th this is actually one of the barriers to a kind of creating a whole business model for, I think, lawyers is that you have to really be a part of the community and, and say, you know, why your services are worth anything. Um, and I think that has a kind of a different perspective than you do. But I think yours is interesting. And you've been successful, though, but you. You very successful for a small, and you guys have you you market all around here because I know I go to the Hanover Co-op. How did you how did you do all that? I mean, did your JD help you at all in some of those nuts and bolts? You can say no, but I won't believe you. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, maybe the uh, the category of places where my JD has been helpful is in the category of like don't fall for bad stuff, and that's out there all over the place. Um, in I, when you say successful, like I mean, our, we make, I think anyway, really good stuff. You know, y'all are having it, um, and uh, you know, our farm employs a, a, just shy of ten, nine people, last count. You know, their families, they do. Um, you know, they're the primary breadwinners for their families, and there's a lot of value that we've grown out of. You know, our our stuff. Our, the reason we got into this was we used to sell to the organic cow, which was a like 50 Vermont farms that were um, like the first organic milk producers in Vermont that were kind of off the, the milk grid doing their own thing. And then they bought, were bought by Horizon, um, who was bought by um, Dean Foods. And they said about killing the brand, because I don't think anybody's bought organic cow anything in the last you know, 10 years. Um, and that loss of a good vibe was the thing that, that made us go forward. Maybe a JD gave us confidence to do that because there were a lot of things to negotiate um, along the way, and if we'd had to hire, uh, you know, a lawyer to do that, I mean, that would, you know, I mean, the truth is, but in terms of like whether we're successful, like could we afford to hire a lawyer to do really anything except a real estate transaction? No, I mean, it's the margins are really tight. You can grow. It's not easy. It's not hard to make. Well, it is hard, but it's you know, it's what we do to make really good stuff. Um, it's not hard to sell it. It's hard to make money doing it. Yeah. Even, so, even with the premium product like organic oh these yeah, days? Totally. We make, you know, we, we bring in over a million dollars and it goes right back out the door every year. Yeah. But that's part of the pressure to get bigger or, you know, to use Earl Bucks's term, unfortunate, uh, get bigger, get out. So one of, the, one of the questions I think we have in New England is how do we grow small and mid-sized farmers and have, them, and have it be a good life, you know? Um, you, that, you, you don't. Like, we don't want to grow. We only have so much land. It will only feed so much cows. Right. No, I meant grow a bunch of more of them, not, not grow you. But how do oh. we sustain that? I don't know. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Okay. I mean, I, I love my life, but uh, if I could milk cows and, and sell it to a company that I felt good at about, you know, um, and um, 
along the time that we jumped ship and went off the milk grid to bottle our own milk um, and bake the ice cream, there were a bunch of people who brought in the uh, Organic Valley label, which is a Cooley Region organic produce pool, and they've been a lot cooler to work with. So for those people, like the good vibe got salvaged, um, and they get to do their farm life and not have to worry about selling everything their cows make in two weeks. You know, Or, well, with uh, two weeks, we basically have three days because it's got a two-week shelf code on it. Sophia, can you talk a little bit about the national perspective? Because you go all the way from the national to you're really truly a coalition, mm -hmm. and you work with um, groups on the ground, really building common platforms. So you kind of see it from a couple of different perspectives. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So I'm, I'm with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with our organization, we're based in Washington, D.C., um, and we are a true coalition in the sense that um, we have a very democratic process for deciding what it is that we work on based on our members that are all grassroots organizations across the country. We currently have over 100 member organizations. Some that might be familiar to you based in New England are um, the Northeast Organic Farm Association, the NOFAs are members of our coalition, the New England Farmers Union is a member of our coalition, um, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners, uh, MAFCA. So it's really a, a wide range. And so when you think of those types of organizations in New England and the Northeast, our membership uh, is representative of those types of organizations, but all across the country. And so we come together to advocate for federal policies and programs that advance the sustainability of agriculture, natural resources, food systems, and rural communities communities. And so as a coalition, you know, we're only as strong as our coalition can be based on the issues that we all agree to work on together. And so the issues that may be important to a dairy farmer in New England aren't necessarily the same issues that are important to a produce farmer in California. And so we have to find those areas of common ground um, and, and agree to work together. And this is all at the federal level, um, trying to influence what's happening uh, in DC, whether that's within federal agencies or within Congress to um, essentially improve the situation for, for farmers at the local level. Um, and, and I came to that work because I grew up on a small farm in Michigan and knew pretty quickly that I didn't want to be a farmer myself, but I saw a lot of the challenges that my parents were facing and wanted to figure out what I could do in a different way to make their lives a little bit easier. Um, and that led me to, to advocacy and to the, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And so for us, you know, it's the, the issues that farmers are facing at the local level and, and figuring out how to grow opportunities um, for farmers or to decrease barriers that they may face. Like I said, it really varies based on where you're located. Um, but a lot of the issues that we find ourselves working on are increasing programs that support farmers that might be looking to build into, um, to, to access new markets or um, are building some of the infrastructure for local and regional markets. So what are programs that can fund those types of projects? What are programs that can fund farmers that want to do more conservation on their land? Um, I spend a lot of time working on FDA regulations that might influence farmers in a, in a different way and make it more difficult for farmers to access markets. And so how do we look at those regulations and see how they can be structured in a way to support farmers of all types and sizes? And so um, at the federal level, the, the issues become a little bit more jumbled. You know, we, we have to try to parse out what's happening at the local level and see how we can have that make sense and be something that we can move forward nationally um and so it, it creates a, a different set of challenges but it's it's also very exciting work so is the farm bureau part of your coalition no the farm bureau is not part of our coalition um the farm bureau is essentially their own coalition of chapters mm -hmm. but NSAC has been really one of the few i think organizations over the last 30 years that's made um really made the progress of the farm bill to have more sustainability provisions mm -hmm. it really served a fundamental role really a critical role would you say that that's accurate? Yeah, yeah. I think our, our coalition brings together um, not only grassroots farm-based organizations, but also conservation associations, um, healthy food access groups. It's really a pretty wide range of voices that come together within our coalition. And so I think that's how we've been able to be successful in getting a, a wide range of programs worked into the farm bill that support sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, um, and local food is by having those policies reflect all the different voices that, that can benefit from those kinds of programs. 
Beth Bobley, could you talk a little bit and, and carry up on this or pick up on the strand that we were talking about with Amy about um, not getting bigger but making it in in um, in New England or any rural area? Sure. Um, so w one of the things that I think um, I've experienced in advising uh, farm and food production clients is, and and I certainly hear what you're saying about you know the price. You know, I th th those are probably. Um, clients who are the most price sensitive, and that's where being a lawyer in this field requires um, being uh, able to really think outside the box. You've got to think uh, outside of that billable hour box. It's the only way you can deliver the legal services that a lot of these clients really, really need because a lot of farmers don't have, you know, they don't have the benefit of a JD degree. Um, and so they don't necessarily know what some of the pitfalls can be as they're scaling up or as new uh, farmers are getting into the business of farming. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I have done is um, I'm, I'm volunteering some of my time as well. Conservation Law Foundation has a legal services food hub, which they first launched in Massachusetts and then they opened, um, launched in Maine. Uh, where I am uh, a volunteer lawyer through that program. Uh, their next one is going to be in New Hampshire. They'll be opening, um, uh, opening, opening it up to uh, New Hampshire. And one of the things that has developed for me is I see new farmers coming in and I'll advise them um, because they're, they're looking at perhaps um, purchasing a piece of land. I have one client right now who I'm working with who has enough resources to be able to buy a piece of land, but they are um, struggling with finding the right piece of land. So I've given them a certain amount of services that are um, pro bono, and then we have an arrangement where once they find the land, then I will do a finite amount of legal work for them that will involve setting up a business structure for them. Um, what I'm trying to do is also help educate out in the community, in the farm community, um, through, and I've done this in Maine, I'm hoping to do this more and more in New Hampshire and Vermont, where we're trying to get the word out, and, and part of it's through the Legal Services Food Hub at CLF. Part of it is um, my former firm, we did a, a conference last March, and we're, we're really trying hard to make sure that the message that's getting out there is, you know, you're not alone. You know, if you want to be a farmer and you want to get, if you know something about farming but you don't know enough about, um, you know, a legal structure perhaps, um, you know, there are resources available. Um, so that's kind of where I have tried to move my uh, educational services, if you will, uh, and I think it's really important. Uh, you know, everyone who practices law, especially in the private sector, there's an expectation that you do some, you know, pro bono work. So for me, it's great fit, it's natural fit, and it works um, really well, and I think it's helping um, I'm hearing people come with a little more education now than I did even two years ago. So a new farmer is coming to me and saying, hey, what about a business structure? It's not something totally new. Um, anyway, that's right. been my experience. One of the things that I say to people when they talk about food laws, I, I start asking them questions, well, what do you mean by food law? And really what they mean, and, and I think one of the backbones of local food is transactional law, it's business law. It's business law more innovative and, and tailored to to this section, to the sector, but it is really business law. Could you talk a little bit about that, Beth? Well, because you've done a lot of your own structures and you have corporate structures and financing and, and production. Can you tell us about some of your innovations? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Without giving away trade secrets? Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's, that's exactly right. At the core of what it means to be an agricultural lawyer, it doesn't mean that you go and find laws that just pertain to how you keep your cows. You need to understand transactional business at a basic level, contracts, um, property, those core concepts. Within the state of Vermont, we have a um, current use program 
that farmers need to avail themselves of so that their taxes are lower, their property taxes are lower. That sometimes, if you are a new farmer, if you're not inheriting your farm, is a difficult hurdle to cross. When you set up your farm, you need to think about how are you going to be managing it? Are you leasing? Are you owning the land? Um, those are two different legal structures. Uh, your insurance company is going to want to know what kind of structure you have so they, they can insure you properly. I think right now insurance companies do so much more than lawyers do with uh, business structure for farms that I ha our agent is sort of, you know, she and I pick each other's brains. Um, once you get your farm set up and you're farming and you have a product and you want to sell it, that's a whole other set of laws that you need to become aware of. And um, are you going to be selling within the state? Are you going to be selling outside of the state? Um, do you want to sell internationally? Are you selling through your own farm? Are you going to be wholesaling? Um, there are retail licenses that you need to have if you're going to be selling directly from your farm. If you're wholesaling, then you need to concern yourself with the liability between your farm and the wholesaler. Um, for us, we decided to vertically integrate because we were having a hard time we had a product, it was a great product, and we were having a hard time getting it down to the markets we needed to be at. And rather than continue to butt heads with the wholesalers that were available in our region, we um, partnered with an established wholesale company called Vermont Quality Meats. They were in Rutland, and they had been a co-op for 20 plus years. Um, we partnered with them, worked with them for about a year, and then the partners who had been doing it for a long time decided to retire, and we moved the company here. So that is also in South Royalton, right downtown facing the green, um, where the unfortunate building that has the white paper up in the windows right now because we are renovating the front of the space, it used to be the pizza place. So we hope that with that vertical integration and also we have our own USDA slaughterhouse. And the reason why we did that is we couldn't get enough space in any of the other slaughterhouses in the state. At the time that we started the farm, there were three USDA slaughterhouses in the state of Vermont and they were all booked and you couldn't get in for a year to a year and a half. Um, we are happy to say that we have a USDA slaughterhouse that is open to the public and not just to us. And we also have a smokehouse that is also USDA um, inspected and also open to the public. <laughs> um, when you have a slaughterhouse, you have a whole new set of regulations that uh, Lori is familiar with from your work. I am trying to give myself a crash course in USDA law and have the um, federal code on my phone. And I will say that it is humbling when your husband has the code memorized and you do not. And he is uh, not the one that went to law school. So, uh, but between the two of us, we're managing to, you know, stay on top of things. I am also the HACCP coordinator at our slaughterhouse, which is another test that you have to take and a class you have to sit for. Not like the bar, not anyway like the bar, but it is another hurdle that you would have to go through. And there are plenty of people who could be your clients as a lawyer that would need advice and guidance and direction and being told, well, there's a class down in Boston, you need to take it, it's one day, you take the test, you pass, now you can have your own processing plant or now you can make your own ready to eat uh, product at your uh, whatever. So it's not just for slaughterhouses. Um, there's a whole bunch of regulations that we have had to make ourselves aware of. Right now, the state of Vermont is redoing their waste regulations. I'm sure you guys are all aware of this. If, if you aren't, um, I'm sure your teachers are aware of it. That is going to affect Vermont farms and how we control our waste, chiefly manure. And it is affecting our waste haulers as well. Um, 
I sit, I'm also on the planning commission in town and we are dealing with the garbage end of it and up at the farm we're dealing with the manure end of it. This, in the regulations as they're written right now, it is, the state of Vermont is saying, and there's still draft regulations, that they are going to require training so that farmers know how to comply with this law and the training can be outsourced. That sounds to me like a good opportunity for some lawyers to make some money from the state to also then become part of your communities and help your farms, and your farms wouldn't have to give you any money for it. Um. I, I just want to make a little note here. You have quite a sophisticated operation, and, and many people starting wouldn't have the wouldn't have the resources. So some people who do have sophisticated or a lot of infrastructure, they are either they have the money in their family or whatever, or they have investors. And there there are socially responsible investors that are really coming to agriculture. And then there are people who just are interested in agriculture and they make investments. But when you're talking about buying a slaughterhouse and a distribution company, I mean that this is these this is infrastructure that costs millions of dollars essentially um, uh, well, although I'm just guessing but I mean it is it's yeah. or it's substantial well I'll say one thing about that we uh, neither of us come from money we are not trust fund babies um, not that there's anything wrong with it but we aren't however um, we had we do have an investor but what I will say and I've learned from this investor who is very active and man in helping us manage and learn is that if you are creative with your proposals to purchase, you can work a deal that is beneficial to you without a million dollars and beneficial to the current owners. Don't look at it as if I have to, if I'm gonna buy something, I have to give them a purchase and sale for the full amount of money, the business is worth X amount, I'm gonna give you that X amount and then you're gonna go away. If you want to be successful in anything, not just agriculture, in the economy that we're in right now, you need to be a little bit more creative. And our investor and my husband are very creative and they think outside the box and I am in the box and it is hard for me to get my brain out of the box. But that is how you do this. You, we did not have a suitcase full of $10 million to start this. That is not what we did. We did have an investor, uh, but we were very creative with how we built this up. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, I want to open it up to all of you because the experience we have here and the differing kind of perspectives I think is really, really important. So Melissa has kind enough to have a wandering uh, microphone. Is there anybody who would like you to raise your hand if you have any questions? All right. So we're very pleased to have the Dean of UVM Extension with us, Doug. Um, so we have, since she's told me who I am, uh, <laughs> we have new farmer classes and the like. Um, so what are the kinds of problems that new farmers get into when they don't go see or get legal advice before they jump in with two feet and start, whether it's very small or large? I mean, what are the normal pitfalls uh, that you find out, oh, I need that legal advice? I'll jump in first. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> uh, I'm not the only one who has an opinion on this. So um, one of the things that I think uh, I hear a lot when I go and, and speak at, at various conferences, and, I, and I've spoken at several of them in the last year and a half, um, is the questions that I get are um, labor-related wage and hour um, rules and wage and hour laws, which are very, uh, they are difficult to understand. And um, most people um, struggle with that. And they say, well, but I've got, you know, it's an intern. I'm like, oh, really, is it? <laughs> are you sure that's an intern? Um, so wage and hour, uh, are, are, that's, a, that's a big issue. And uh, here in Vermont, there were, uh, what, 20 some odd farmers who were nailed by the Department of Labor for violations of wage and hour law. Um, I think, there, I, I'm, I'm not gonna hog the microphone, but that, that's one example. Well, I, we were not, my husband grew up on the farm that we live on, so we don't have that same thing. Um, but uh, farm succession is gonna be a big deal for us. Um, we 
kind of inherited this structure of the farm as well. If we were starting from scratch, we'd have some pretty big questions. We've got four kids. Um, looking at them right now, there's one of them who's probably a pretty good candidate to do this, whether or not we wish it upon him. Uh, and so that's, but that'll be, when that time comes, it'll be messy because we've got it tied up in Earl's family and all kinds of different ways. And so sorting that out, we're starting to try to do a piece at a time. One sister is trading in a piece of land for, you know, uh, for her greater share of that. Um, so I don't know how you do that with a crystal ball, but leaving options open and making plans that, um, that deal with what you're gonna do with your farm because it's this huge asset and you feel really tied to it like a you know like it's one of our children and I hear about other friends in town who are selling their house and moving someplace by choice and it doesn't even seem like that's possible to us and, and I know for most people land and houses is you can you can get a better house but to get a better piece of land we have to build our piece of land uh, so but that doesn't make it any I mean but we're not going to be on it forever so making that plan moving forward the recommended agricultural practices, that is huge, and doing that right. And we were just at a, I was at a meeting Monday um, at the, uh, in White River with the, the guy, Ryan Hatch, who's doing, um, going around saying, like, we're friendly, we want to help farmers comply with this. And these are things like um, m making sure your manure pit doesn't run into running water, um, buffers, things. Like right now, we, our cows are on a rotational pasture, and they have 52 pastures all around the farm. Some of them cross streams. Some of them have streams that go through them. Uh, if there's, he's saying, if you've got signs of erosion that you have to fence off your stream, uh, it turns out that that means if there's one hoof print, that's a sign of erosion. You know, this is going to cut into what we can do. But I mean, obviously, we don't want our streams to rush off. And most of these recommended agricultural practices are designed to solve a problem that doesn't exist on our side of the mountain, the Green Mountains. So that's kind of a tricky spot, too. So I, I don't know. Problem-wise, uh, you know, if you want to live in the... Can, um, the Addison County, you're going to get, yeah, there's a big problem there. You're going to get lots of funding to help you. And if you live in this side of the state, you have to reply with all those regulations and you don't get any money. So to do it. I'd like to just kind of piggyback on what you said about farmland succession, which is critical. Sometimes it's the major asset people hold. And then how do they divide that up, like you just noted. And the other thing is, is that our, our farmers, as we have some statistics you might have seen roll on the, ta on, the, on the slides, they're aging out, essentially. And we do want new farmers. And in some New England states, we actually have a new boom of farmers. But to afford land and infrastructure, if you don't inherit it, or you don't have an investor, or you're not thinking outside the box, or all the above, is really difficult in getting onto that land. So those are some of our fundamental issues to really perpetuate small-scale farming and, and have it grow, actually, in this region. Did you want to pick up on that a little bit? Beth? Well, I can add or something that... Or, you know, please go ahead, Sophie. Um, We'd love it. So this is just a... This is changing the, the focus just a little bit. I mean, the, the issue of um, farmland access and succession is a huge one that's going to require a lot of concerted efforts to address, I think, you know, across the country. Um, but there, there is also, or I, I should say, I, I never want to discount the value of small actions that can be taken to address specific problems as well. And just as one example of that, um, in our role, we were doing outreach on a new um, farm service agency, an FSA loan program that provided farm storage facility loans that farmers could use to upgrade like cold storage facilities on their farms. And this was a great new program, really excited about it. We were doing a lot of outreach and then we had a beginning farmer couple approach us because they tried to get one of these loans, but they couldn't, they weren't eligible for it because they didn't have crop insurance. And they couldn't get crop insurance because they had to have at least five or six years of a production history in order to get crop insurance and they didn't have that because they were beginning farmers. So they were in this tight situation where they couldn't take advantage of this really great loan program because of these requirements um, for their production history for crop insurance purposes. But we were able to sort of facilitate a, a conversation between those farmers and the FSA to waive that crop insurance requirement for beginning farmers so that they were still able to access this farm storage loan facility or farm storage facility loan program. Um, and that's something that, you know, it, it, it took some conversations, but based on relationships that we've developed through our advocacy work, we were able to provide that, that service or that role um, 
and they've now accessed that loan. And so that's something where, you know, where there are specific problems, you know, I'm always interested to hear what some of the specific ones are to see how we might be able to make small tweaks to the larger uh, framework and then, you know, resolve some of those smaller issues to make it just a little bit easier. Hi, uh, my name is Paige. I work at the Energy Clinic on anaerobic digester projects, and I was wondering if you could speak more on the topic of waste and uh, how we could remove roadblocks, legislative roadblocks, to dealing with municipal solid waste, uh, on-farm waste, um, food waste, and, uh, and on a community scale, uh, and to diversify farmers' revenue streams, um, or if you see that as a possibility at all in the state. Policy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I can address the Vermont state-specific approach. Um, I know that there was a bill recently introduced by um, Representative Shelley Pingree from Maine on food waste in particular and a variety of legislative solutions that could address um, different issues, and some of them had to do with uh, making it easier for farms to put digesters on their property, so smaller scale viability. Some of them had to do with um, standards for produce so that it was easier to get like ugly produce into school programs. Um, some of them had to do with uh, right now for the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the EQIP program. Uh, this is a conservation program for farmers. There isn't a conservation practice standard for compost, and so that if that were part of the program, it would make it easier for farmers to access funding to help them do more composting of waste on their farm. Um, so that's something that has been introduced. I'm not sure necessarily at what point we'll see some of those ideas integrated into a broader federal farm policy. Maybe those are some ideas that we'll see in the next farm bill. Um, but currently there isn't anything that's moving right now that addresses the issue, but maybe at the state level. There is. Why, why are high tunnels a conservation practice, but composting's not under EQIP? That's a big question. You have to ask yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's time. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean that people aren't composting. Mm -hmm. And composting, sure. the recommended agricultural practices are now in their, like, submitting comments for their second draft. And defining compost is part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but compost is a hurdle. Like, the Vermont Compost Company, just, just outside of Montpelier, um, used to have really big business. And I'm not sure where they're at with this. I know that there was some trouble. And, um, but they used to get the, um, be, the area schools would bring all their leftovers, you know, that slot bucket, and they would go there and they would compost them. And it's great nutrients. I mean, we don't, on the farm, think of it as waste management. It's manure management, because those are nutrients that we want back on our soils. And we're in, you know, if, if we didn't have them, we'd be, our land would be depleted and we'd be out of business in a couple of years. Um, so for us, it's, we need to add nutrients to our land. Uh, you know, every time you drink a, you know, bottle of milk, all that good nutrition came out of our soil. And some of it comes back in from the sunshine at crops that we plant, like nitrogen fixers, like legumes, and some cover crops that we do. Um, but by and large, we're nutrient depleting, so we need to bring nutrients back. Uh, we do that with a soil management plan. We buy micronutrients. Um, we don't buy a lot of fertilizer. Mostly we buy lime every couple of years, well, like five to ten years on, our, on a rotating schedule. But manure is a big part. And we also buy some grain for our cows. If we were to go to a strict grass-fed um, and not feed any grain, we don't feed a whole lot, but those are nutrients that come in off our farm that add, um, come onto our farm. So if we were, um, you know, but... If it, the regulations were to break down and make it easier for food uh, waste from schools and from restaurants, and, and they need to do something with that because Vermont is diverting all of their, I'm, I'm not sure how that business is going, what's happening with that. All the stuff you have to compost now needs some place to compost it. And we would welcome those nutrients on our place. Whether we may run into organic hurdles, but there are certainly other conventional farms that might have an easier time with it. Uh, at our farm, we we also reuse our manure, and um, we also have local vegetable farmers that take it. We haven't, until this year, ever thought of it as something that needed to be disposed of because it's, like, as you said, it's a, it's a nutrient that needs to go back into our soils. The first two years we were in business, we had to buy manure 
because the properties that we bought had been vacant farms for a period of time and they were depleted of nutrients. And it's nice that the last three years we haven't had to buy any because we have enough. Um, in town, I know that our uh, transfer station, the Bethel Roads and Transfer Station, has been looking into composting and selling it. But there are some legal issues that Vermont Compost, which I don't know the specifics of, ran into uh, liability issues with their end user. And that has our manager of the transfer t station leery of making compost. So that is a hurdle that then needs to be addressed because otherwise he would be willing to do that. As far as a digester, we looked at that our first year or second year. Uh, methane digester is what we looked at. The cost of it and the efficiency of it did not make sense to us at the time. We couldn't make enough um, power from it to justify the expense. We do have a system at one of our barns that takes uh, the manure from the cows that then is not scraped off. It is left to provide padding and heat in the wintertime. And then the heat that is transferred into the concrete is moved over to a um, boiler that then heats our pig barn and lo you saw this correct I did and I was I describing this correctly it was a beautiful thing yeah it was um, that's a design uh, of my husband's to save us money on propane and it works beautifully we've had it for three years four years and um, it also keeps our cows and our pigs, you know, nice and, and warm. We have a three-sided barn at that facility, so the cows are in a barn in the winter months that um, has one open side. The pigs are in a in a covered barn because that we have a um, this is our nursery over there, so we we have our, our sows and our piglets, and that's what we're doing. I know. That also, the last thing I would say is that we have worked with VTC. And they do have a methane digester up there. We were hoping to possibly, if we needed to move some of our manure over there, we were looking into that. I think that VTC is running into the same issue of cost and it not being cost effective for them to operate it. I don't know where they are with that program. So. So can I just jump in from the uh, perspective? I have represented two different waste haulers. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to really get them engaged and involved. Um, I know that with, with one of them, which is a current client of mine, uh, they would be very interested in exploring um, what kind of partnerships and what kind of creative um, endeavors uh, could be used to really change the stream in a way from the traditional. Um, so I. I think we should try and find some ways to connect. Uh, I just want to make a comment, too, about the, the waste for manure. I think you have smaller kind of production uh, number of animals, but in larger uh, animal production, we have CAFOs that are very, very large. They're producing way too much manure that can possibly be used. And, and if, in fact, there was a recent, a pretty recent case using um, uh, RICRA, solid waste, uh, that the spreading of manure really uh, rose to the level of solid waste and that it couldn't, the nutrients just couldn't be used on land. There were too many and it was leaching into the waterways in the Northwest. Um, but so we, there, there's a point that you get to that tipping point if you don't have enough land or a balance, but clearly you have a whole plan and are very cognizant of that. But in larger production facilities, that may not be the case. And I think that the new RAP is one of the reasons why, uh, as a farmer, we're frustrated is it almost seems like they're trying to regulate um, CAFOs in Vermont. And I think that we may have two in the whole state. And the rest of us now, as the, as the definitions are, wor are worded right now, a small farm, and then you look at the definition for medium farm, th there's a gap there. So you won't be a medium farm, but you're not a small farm. What are you supposed to do? 
It doesn't make any sense. They, they closed that in the revised thing that they just rolled out yesterday. Oh, Monday. all right then. That was good. <laughs> there is, there is the, the small farm that was like five cows or whatever right. is now up to 50, and then so it's 50 and above is, so there's now a small farm is that gap, okay. and then lower than that, it's got some weird name. Yeah, because I, I'm the one, you know, advising all of us and saying what we need to do, and I'm reading the definition going, I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense to me. We're not this and we're not that. So, um, and I think that it's important to protect our waterways, and I think that farmers all want to protect their water. That That's our resource as well. And um, how do we water our animals? It's We need clean water, and we need clean water for our farm. We, a lot of our farms, too, have tenants on them that either they're workers or um, I know farms that just that's an extra source of income for them. So it the the CAFO's style law here needs to it needs to make sure that it is applying to what we have in this state not just well everyone else has it so let's do that because it's a good idea the last time I was on the stage it was moderating the new TMDL panel um, and I think that part of this is about you don't have to be a, a CAFO to be polluting, essentially be leaching into our waterways. And so, but this is one of those ongoing debates and it's actually way more civilized in Vermont than it is in other parts of the country, but yet we're still struggling. I mean, who's gonna pay for this and how do we have production and clean up some of the iconic waterways of the state? And it's something that we haven't been able to do yet. And it's really, um, it's really right in front of us now. And how do we do that? And we kind of, you, you represent part of that conundrum. Any other comments or questions? John? Hi, uh, John Maley. Um, my question is, with the nutrient management plan, um, I just went through the course because I do it on my parents' farm, and comparing it to the Act 64, when you get into how much phosphorus and nitrogen when you spread manure in your fields, um, if you have too much phosphorus from a soil sample, then they're like saying, well, you almost can't spread manure in that field. Well, in a manure spreader, you can't separate your nutrients um, by the chemistry of it. Uh, so I, I see that as a major problem to a lot of farmers and it's very frustrating because that field might need nitrogen and you may not need, have money to go buy that. So I just, that aspect of trying to limit your phosphorus on your field, you're losing quite a bit of the nutrients for um, nitrogen which plants need. Mm -hmm. Any comments to that? I mean, well, yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, this is this is the game, you know. Um, if I mean, that was fortunately not our, you know, not our when our soil samples came back, you know, we, that wasn't what we were looking at. Um, I know that you can, you know, North Country Organics makes a custom blend with no phosphorus. You know, it's it's expensive stuff, but once you get back in balance, then you're there. I mean, that's balance, and the idea is that long term soil management, like if you've got too much fossil, you know, that's, you know, your soil being out of balance is, is your own, you know, it's like your house falling down. Like you gotta, you gotta shore it up if you're gonna, you know, continue to grow stuff on there and, you know, in perpetuity and build the soils. Um, and this might be a good time to do it because it sounds like there's funding for these programs that you can get some help to get your soils back in balance. You know, and hopefully not all the you know hopefully not all the land is in that you would have still some places where you could sell you know spread manure and then other places to bring those fields back into balance and it sounds like we haven't tested these waters yet that you know the resources are there they're talking about um, 80 90 even 100 percent cost share on getting some help now this is you know if you've got a phosphorus problem you're getting you know top priority on on help there hopefully that happens you know Go back to something that Beth had talked about, uh, the legal implications involved when you are selling certain products or where you're selling them. Um, it seems to me a lot of people in this room have that type of agricultural legal knowledge, but we don't necessarily know how to reconcile it with what's happening on the ground to a farmer in an everyday situation. Um, I think that there's an opportunity for us to help serve as liaisons and bridge that knowledge gap but I'd love to hear what you all think are those opportunities um, and how we can get involved. Uh, so if you are helping a, a farm, and the first thing that I would ask is where, where's your market? Who do you want to sell to? 
it's always good to have a clear picture of what your plan is. And that has been key to our success is having uh, an advisor who understands that planning is very important. To just sort of go out there and start raising stuff and have no idea what you're going to do with the end product will be the death of your, your enterprise. A lot of farmers are having a hard time with understanding the difference between uh, selling in, in the state of Vermont, which is much easier, versus marketing and selling outside. There's obviously more money to be had if you take your product interstate, but there are more regulations. And that would be a good thing to become aware of so that you could help local farmers. Also, there's a difference in um, state-inspected slaughter facilities versus federally inspected facilities. Vermont still allows a certain amount of on-farm slaughter. That's something that comes up a lot with smaller operators at our distribution company. Uh, there are certain products that you can slaughter on a farm and uh, you can sell interstate. And then there are certain products that you cannot. And as a food distributor or a, co a cooperative of farms, you need to know that. You that'll be, that would shut you down if you did that incorrectly. Those are examples I can think of off the top of my head. Sophia, could you talk about your role translating, because you do that quite a bit, between the FDA and on the ground uh, realities? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's a good question because I think that there is a, an important role for um, lawyers to serve as that liaison function. Um, and so just as an example in my work, a lot of what I do is regulatory and policy analysis. So in this particular instance, the FDA will put out proposed rules governing um, on-farm food safety for produce growers. And so someone needs to be able to read that those regulations, figure out what they mean, um, and then have the relationships with organizations that work with farmers or the farmers themselves to be able to explain, okay, this is what I think this new rule is going to mean for your operation. What, what can you, tell me, tell me how that will work for you. You know, what does that mean about your costs of doing business? What does that mean about the types of production practices that you'll be doing? What kinds of upgrades are you going to need to make? How are you going to have to transform your record keeping practices? Um, so being able to present that information in a way that makes sense and then get those responses and then feed them back to the agency and say, okay, I see what you're trying to do here, but if you keep it this way, then these are the costs that are going to come out of the farming community in complying with the rules, and there's got to be another way that we can make this work so that, you know, we're both achieving our goals. And so being able to, to serve as that bridge um, is, is an incredibly valuable function, and that's something that we've seen uh, particularly effective over the years as FDA has been doing these, uh, this rulemaking on these food safety rules. They just put out final rules after a very long sort of protracted process with a lot of opportunities for us to do just this kind of liaison work. Um, that have a lot of provisions in them that address some of those significant concerns. And so um, I think it's an incredibly valuable role. You know, you don't have to be a lawyer to do that kind of work, but I find it incredibly valuable um, in, in, in terms of the way that I'm able to understand what the agency is trying to do and then be able to reflect the concerns of the farmers that we work with back to the agency in a way that makes sense to them. Um, in terms of opportunities on how to do that, you know, there are a lot of advocacy organizations that work directly with farmers or farm organizations um, in D.C. that are doing this kind of work all the time. There are organizations that do that at the state level. Um, and so, you know, talking with those organizations, seeing what kind of opportunities they have for you to partner with them and be able to provide that kind of analysis or that kind of support is one way to go. So pick an area where you want to be and, and start talking to them. Hi. I was a small grade A goat dairy for a while, running it myself, and so I'm going to share with you a few rambling thoughts I have, and hopefully they'll end up connecting. Um, the definition of sustainability when one's talking about farming, um, yes, you can make a million dollars, and yes, it goes back out. For me, that has to include um, when the farmer wants to get their teeth cleaned, preventive care, or when they need a root canal, can they afford it without it causing a problem? When they would like to have hay 
two weeks off of vacation? Is that possible? Do they have people in place who they can trust to do the work as well as they would want it done? Um, you're going to burn out. I think that those of you who have JDs and are now farmers or closely linked to farming, um, you've talked a little bit about how has your JD um, enhanced your opportunities or ability to be a successful farmer. I have a feeling that at some point in your life, having been a farmer will be what enhances your ability with your JD. Nothing informs you as well, no matter how much empathy you think you can have for a farmer until you've been one. And it's been your income. And most likely, if it's been your only income, then you'll know what it's about. Um, thank you for the work you do, and um, good luck. Thanks for coming today. Well, there's a voice of happiness there. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I, I hear what you're saying totally, and I, in terms of um, health care, the state of Vermont has great programs for people who don't like them, make a lot of money, and so that's a, you know, uh, fortunately for that, my kids have health and dental all the way through, and we've got health and, you know, dental. I'm, you're right, I should make an appointment. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in terms of vacation, you know, we, th we think about this. We actually have some, some great folks on the farm, and we're really lucky to be at a scale. We milk 70 cows, which is just big enough to have full-time help that you can lean on heavy when you need to. Um, it comes with all its own challenges, but we've got that, and we're, we're lucky in that, in that zone. Um, but we say to ourselves, you know, every day, like, you know, this is how we want to live, and it's not. And our food system across the whole country, maybe the world, is subsidized by people wanting to live like this. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the Caribbean for, to visit a friend a couple of years, or last year, right around this time, and that was an interesting experience that I don't ever need to do again. You know, um, that's not how I want to live. You know, every sunrise and every sunset belong to me and, um, and to my kids. And they, you know, they're the, my youngest is nine, my oldest is 15. They all know how to drive. You know, they all can milk the cows if they need to. They all know how to cook supper, you know, um, and they know how to work together. And, you know, we got a lot of stuff done at the end of the day, but we have a really good time doing it. And I don't... Um, I don't see myself ever practicing law, and I'm pretty grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful for my legal education, but mostly for the big picture stuff that came with it, like the in order to form a more perfect union. You know, I feel like that's what I did in my three years. I don't know what else, what you all are doing, that's what I did when I was here. Um, and the stuff that I really cared most about, like it all kind of boiled down to that, and that plays out pretty much every day on the farm, you know, in the small scale, like how do the systems, like we want to take care of the land you know with the resources we have we want to take care of each other with the resources how do we build those resources you know we don't just build them you know we build them from the sunshine by planting the crops that make best use of that we build them in our family by taking care of each other in ways that sort of build our systems for dealing with each other and um you know try to get better at, at all of that you know and uh it's a really hard way to live in some ways but it's a pretty easy way in another like I haven't had to bite my tongue you know or <laughs> as you can tell Clearly. Uh, yeah. uh, you know or suck up to a boss you know and uh, I hope my employees can say the same thing and you know we live in a world of you know hard work yeah but it's honest and it's true and you know uh, you know whether in the end I've got anything left to show for it kind of don't care <laughs> okay see since I'm the private attorney on the panel here. Um, I'm just going to put in a, a little plug for practicing attorneys. Um, I think we still have a place in society that's a very good one. Uh, I am incredibly grateful that we also have uh, uh, JDs who have turned to the farming life. Um, I am a huge, huge fan of, of um, 
the local farms and I support them. I go to my farmer's market. I, I, I know the farmers. Um, but there's also something about practicing law that is quite wonderful, and I feel like there is, there are ways to do it that uh, aren't, yes, I have to bite my tongue sometimes. There are certainly clients where I've had to chomp hard on my tongue. Um, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a role that uh, private attorneys play. There's a role that attorneys play in shaping public policy. Um, and I think one of the things that the farm and food movement has done, and those of us who are moving and practicing in that area, is we're finding ways that we um, find common ground and work together. Um, so I'm getting very philosophical here, but those are, you know, th those are, that's why I became a lawyer. Um, I, I wanted, I got involved because of, of land use issues in Vermont. And um, I think there are important roles that, that lawyers play in, in all of that. So. Well said, and I, and I think the thing is, is that, and one of the things I tell my students is that we can create the law uh, in, in the way that we want it to be, that could be supportive. It doesn't have to be in service to large consolidated food producers. It's really about relationships and reflecting those relationships in documents that, that will help you continue doing what you want to do. And so there's a real opportunity here, and there's a real opportunity to do it differently and not be constrained by what law school was in the past. And why I invited you all here was because, for me, you exemplify that, um, doing it the way you wanted to do it and not letting anybody tell you how you were going to do it. One more, yeah, and we'll wrap it up then. First, I want to thank you all for being here today. But um, we've talked a lot about the rural side, but I wonder if any of you could attest to how to bridge the gap between agriculture and the urban environment. Do you want to speak to that? Because you, you've worked in both. Go ahead, I'm just going to say that we are in uh, New York City and Boston every single week. Our product, not myself personally. Uh, and. That is a way that we bring South Royalton to Manhattan every single week. We have some great clients that love getting product from Vermont. Uh, my husband goes down and at least once a month and basically explains what we do up here. One of the things that I think is going to make farms profitable in Vermont and possibly all of New England is agritourism. And that is a great way to bring urban dwellers up here and let them experience what it means to work and live on a farm and also allow you, the farms to make a little bit more money. So those would be my two thoughts. And we are so close. Where we live right now in New England, we're so lucky that we are so close to so many urban centers as opposed to out west where it is so spread out. And we don't have to farm the way they do out west. We went out west to learn how to become a cattle farm. We didn't know. And we, we learned that the way that they ranch out west is every single stage of a cow's life is segmented. And so there are cow-calf operators, and then there are feeders, and then there are stockers. We do everything at our farm. We, we get our cows pregnant. We have calves, we raise our calves, we either put them into our breeding pool or we uh, feed them until they're ready to be harvested. And we're lucky that we can do that in New England. Our, our pastures are more efficient than out west and our market is closer. So um, th those are my thoughts. Um, I, I, I agree with the markets that are available for the farmers in New England and the Northeast. Um, the other thing that's happening, I, I live in Portland, Maine, which is a huge um, food, uh, uh, food city. I mean, there are a lot of restaurateurs there who are um, working directly with farmers, and the farmers are developing and growing um, produce that they've never tried before because the chefs are willing to experiment with different kinds of, of produce. And it is just, it, it's feeding on itself. So that's where, that's a direct um, connection between the farmer and the urban community. Um, Portland has become truly a destination city. 
uh, for people who like food and like to eat. And um, it is, uh, I, I think we're seeing more and more of that. The other thing that I'm seeing is uh, the urban farming. And that's, that's becoming really huge as well. Uh, and that's really fascinating because there are um, unused areas in most any metropolitan area that can be used for, for growing. Um, so we're seeing that as well. Yeah, and from a, a federal policy perspective, um, if you followed the most recent farm bill reauthorization process that took multiple years, there was a moment when in the House they tried to separate out the farm funding portion from the food funding portion of the farm bill. So it's called the farm bill, but it, most of the money and programs that it authorizes go towards nutrition assistance programs. And so there was an attempt to split those. And while nutrition assistance isn't exclusively an urban concern, it's certainly predominantly an urban, there are just more people there that are taking advantage of those programs. It's, you know, in rural areas important as well. But nevertheless, there was an attempt to split the farm bill into those two pieces, and it didn't work. And so there's a lot of talk now about what's going to happen in this next farm bill process. You know, will they, is there, you know, is there going to need to be more conversation between urban focused representatives and senators and the rural focus um, to try to continue to keep those together because it's, it's unlikely that either one of them could really pass without the support of the other. So I think you'll see more attempts to bridge some of that urban-rural divide in coming years. I think you have the final word. Oh. That was it. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank our panel for their time. I know they're, they're all very busy, and uh, to have their time today has been really special. And um, plus they're VLS grads, who and they're, they're the best grads of all, right? So thank you, and thank you for um, uh, coming in to uh, share this, this uh, afternoon with us for National Ag Day.